where L4 came from was this project that was started by Yochin Leidke. He had quite a career in the industry before going back to academia and starting this project to build a microkernel where IPC was really fast. How do you do that? The reason that IPC is so fast in L4 and why it makes sense that all of your phones are running it is because the design of L4, it was motivated, so this was 1993, so there'd been some experience with microkernels in the sense that maybe they weren't fast enough. That's why these monolithic kernels were surviving. And they weren't fast enough because of poor IPC. So IPC is inter-process communication. L4, this was actually L3, what the paper was about but it evolved into many other operating systems, including L4, which is the main one running on your devices. The whole design was based around this goal of making IPC fast, and they were able to get it about 20 times faster than it was in other microkernels that had already tried to optimize it like Mach. How do you do that? So the first thing, if you want to make your microkernel simple and efficient, you want to keep it simple. You want to have simple abstractions, and you want to not have anything that you don't really need. So the abstractions that L3 provides, you've got a task. This is sort of similar to Rust task. I will use the same name that they used, which is a task, even if that's a little confusing that task can mean slightly different things in lots of different contexts. What a task is, is a set of threads, and each thread has some global unique ID. So there's some way to identify a particular thread, and that way of identifying it is a unique ID. It is like a Rust task in that it owns its own address space, so that makes it like a process, and it can have also some shared data. So this is in many ways very similar to the task abstraction that you get from Rust. The other abstraction that L3 provides is a message. This is the way you can communicate between tasks. A message has a sender, so there's some thread ID that it's going from and some thread ID that it's going to, and these are these unique IDs that are associated with each thread. And it can have some contents, and we'll talk more about those contents yet. And there's a few different ones, depending on how big the contents are, different ways to do IPC. And this IPC in L4 is really optimized to make, if the contents are small, it's super fast. And if the contents are bigger, it's not going to be quite as fast. And then the job of the kernel, it manages tasks. So it is responsible for setting up a task and giving it its own address space. And it's responsible for controlling the message passing. So in order for a message to get between tasks, it's going to go through the kernel. But that's really all the kernel is supposed to do, is to control those two things. We still want it to deal with things like hardware interrupts. So if it's controlling the radio on your phone, when something comes in on that radio, it needs to get to the right place. So what is a hardware interrupt going to look like in L3? Yeah, exactly. Well, there is some, something coming in from the hardware. It's just a message from a kernel to a task to some thread ID. And then that thread is supposed to know how to handle that message. So that's part of how to keep the design simple, is to try to have a small number of abstractions, keep them simple, very minimal design. What are the things that we need to do? So now we have our two tasks. Let's say one is a user-level application, and one is the screen, the driver that controls the screen. And we need to send a message between a thread in task A and a thread in task B. What are the minimum steps we need to do that? Can it work like it looks like in this picture? Good. Yeah, so it can't look exactly like this picture. There's no way to safely allow processes to communicate directly. That has to go through the kernel. At a minimum, it's going to go through the kernel. If we want to have any kind of safety, any kind of isolation, we need to have our messages go through the kernel. We need something that thread A is going to do to set up the message. It has to know who it's talking to. So it needs to know the unique ID of the thread that it's sending the message to. It needs to load the message, and then it calls the kernel. So this is like a system call in Linux or any monolithic kernel. What does the kernel need to do to get the message into thread B? So there's going to be a few steps. So the kernel needs to know which process to switch to. So the kernel is going to need to do some kind of lookup to know the task. But that's some internal data structure in the kernel to know that. And it's going to have to do a switch to task B. And it's going to have to find some way to get that message into the memory that task B can see. So that's the minimum steps that it has to do. So it will do that. And I think the one step that I didn't mention, it has to set up the ID for A to know where the message is going to go back to. And then it switches back to user mode, and task B receives it. So that's the minimal way to do IPC. There's, there's no steps there. At least if you can figure out how to remove any of those steps and still have safe IPC, 
then you should build a faster microkernel and get it on billions of cell phones instead of L4. This was from the, the 1993 paper. They actually figured out the instructions to do that and how much they would cost. So I've hidden the actual execution cycles on there now. Which one of those instructions do you think is going to be the expensive one? You see the total is about 127 cycles, which in 1993 was running on a 5 megahertz mach machine, so was orders of a few microseconds. What's the expensive one? What's actually the real expensive one is going to be this interrupt. Right? Interrupts are expensive. We're calling it a kernel. So that's actually where the majority of the execution cycles go. Now, it does depend a lot on your hardware architecture, what's expensive. And the ones that can produce TLB misses could be very expensive in terms of time. But the switch in the kernel is always going to be expensive. There are a lot of assumptions that this relies on. So the big assumption that it relies on is that the task that the message goes to is sitting around waiting for it. So there's no timeouts here. There's no jumping to special handlers. This only works if our two tasks are very well synchronized. The receiving thread has to be waiting for the message to come in. It knows what to do when it gets it. The sender calls the kernel and waits for the reply. So there's no timeouts. There's no way to jump around to handlers here. This assumes a very simple model where everything knows what it's doing. There's a paper linked, which came out last year, that looks at what they've learned from 20 years. So that 1993 paper came out, described the first one. And the cycles here looks like about double from what we saw. And that probably is because it's including the average cost of the TLB message in that count as well. And you can see that these things vary quite a bit. Depending on the processor, it can be down to 36 cycles on the itaniums, but pretty reasonable on a modern ARM processor. Way less than what other microkernels were at the time. And so that's that factor of 20 improvement over the mock kernel. All we've talked about so far assumed a very small message some message that could be sent in a register between the two processes. What if there's some data? Like, so you're printing on the display. You've got to send some string that could be arbitrarily long. How does that complicate this? So now we've got, instead of just sending a small value in a register, we've got some data structure. Let's say it's a string in the memory of task A. We need to get that into the memory of task B. So what's the obvious way to do that? Yeah, so if we want to copy it directly, well, what it means to copy it directly is we've got to copy it into the kernel, and then the kernel can copy it into B's memory. So we actually have to copy it twice, which is pretty expensive. If we want to only copy it once, so we definitely are going to have to copy it once. If these editor spaces are really isolated, they can't see it together. And if they could see it, well, then it's not isolated. So B could modify what's in that value, which we don't want. So the way to avoid those copies is to have some space that's set up to receive it. Before the 10 happens, process B is going to set up some space, and this is the data space that's the shared memory between the tasks, that can be used to receive this message. And so then we only need one copy. Task A can now write into that space safely, avoiding that extra copy. If you want to share data back and forth, you've got to have data spaces in both tasks to do that. What are the trade-offs between? So we've seen these two main designs of kernels. We've got the monolithic Linux kernel. We've got the L4 microkernel. What are the main trade-offs between these two approaches? What are advantages of the monolithic kernel design? OK, so it could be like a more coherent system because you control everything that's in that kernel. It's true if, if the libraries that are in user space are not controlled by the same vendor. In some sense, that's more of a marking question. So you could certainly have a microkernel where the same vendor controls the libraries and can design them in a coherent way. Could be an important difference, but it's not really a fundamental difference between the designs. Um, what's, what's the most fundamental difference between the designs? That's this trade-off that sort of motivated all this work at making IPC inexpensive. So with the monolithic, because everything's in the kernel, we don't need a lot of context switches. And with a microkernel, we need many. Right? So that's why we need cheap IPC is really important. We need a lot of inter-process communication. So that sounds like that, that's the big advantage of the monolithic kernel. What's the big advantage of the microkernel? OK, good. Yeah, so it can be more stable. This is the whole advantage of processes, that the processes that are now outside the kernel that would have been in the monolithic Linux kernel, they're all memory isolated. And if your file system crashes, well, that doesn't 
bring down the whole system. Probably still causes problems for you if you lose your fuss. But maybe you can reboot that while other applications are still running. The real advantage here that's related to this, that it's small, that the code of the kernel is small. Why do we care about that? What's the advantage of having the kernel code be small? Yes. Yeah, so if it's smaller, it has less bugs. And it might even be small enough that we can actually understand the whole thing. The size differences are really big here. This is the size of L4 kernels. This was the L3 in the original paper. It's about 7,000 lines. And one of the good things about the evolution of all these variants of the L4 kernel, like if you look at the evolution of Linux or Windows NT and its successors, they always get bigger. And the people developing these L4 success, L3 successors know that being small is good. So it really hasn't grown significantly in the 20 years since the original L3. By comparison, Linux is up to about 16 million lines of code that do run in kernel mode. Iron kernel, which does very little, is already bigger than L4. If we're advocating microkernel design, iron kernel is not on the right track. Now, a lot of it is Rust core. We also have 46 lines for printing the logo. So the real advantage of being small is, well, it's smaller, so there are less bugs, but it's also small enough that you can actually reason about it. And what they've been able to do with L4, there's a version of L4, which is not the version that's running on your cell phone, that they've been able to formally verify. Small enough that you can actually prove properties about the whole kernel. So what does it mean to formally verify a kernel? They've actually not just checked for things like, well, it will never crash, never use something unsafe, They've gone to this much stronger thing that they can actually prove that it behaves as specified in all situations. Right. And then you get to the question, well, how precise is the specification to know what they've really proved? But that's, that's a very strong verification. One thing you should be aware of about this, the code is really small. That's what makes this possible. The proof is 200,000 lines to actually prove it. And it took about 20 person years of effort to create the proof, even though it's only about a few months of person effort to actually implement the kernel. So proving correctness is much harder than actually creating it. But given the advantages of having a kernel that's really stable and secure and provably slow, um, maybe that effort is actually worthwhile. Certainly interesting to be able to do this. What should the specification of the properties you're proving look like? When they say they prove that it behaves as expected, what should the spec for the scheduler be? At a high level, what property do you want to ensure that the scheduler has? There are lots of properties that you might want to know about how you're sharing resources. And those get into the policy, right? So that gets to constrain the policy, which is actually something that you really want outside the microkernel. Even L4 doesn't actually get to that point of having the scheduling policy outside. But you really want it outside. So at that level, what you really want the scheduler to do is just say, well, every time we schedule, we're going to switch to some thread. We're going to select some thread from the set of threads that we have now, and we're going to switch to it, or we're going to switch to idle. So that's the spec. And it's at that level of saying, well, we're going to guarantee that our scheduler code always does this, which might sound like you're not guaranteeing anything very strong. But this also guarantees that the scheduler always finishes, and it always you know, picks some thread or picks the idle thread. So it's actually quite a strong property of guarantee. 